Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first Telcop for 2024. I feel like we're starting a bit late this year, and that wasn't intentional. It's just, I guess, the year kind of gets away from you, doesn't it? It's already the end of March, and I can't believe it. Uh, somebody earlier said it's week four of term one. I, I don't teach in term one, so I didn't even realize that, but we're like a third of the way through term one. So I think this year is is definitely getting away from us. But nonetheless, we're here. We, we're here for the first one and, and looking forward to talking to people about various different things. But in particular, I suspect this year we will end up talking a bit about generative AI. Because I think it's fair to say that generative AI is having is having a moment, is having a long moment, has been having a moment for the last 12 to 18 months. And so even in our discipline area of technology enhanced learning, uh, it's definitely one of those things that is uh, that is being discussed a lot. People want to talk about that technology in particular, right? That's the thing. So with that in mind, I was talking to Robert and saying, what can we do to start the telcop off? And he sort of said, well, why don't I get up and why don't I talk a little bit about, um, about generative AI and academic integrity? And what does it mean to cheat? using generative AI. And knowing Robert, I suspect this is going to be a fairly spicy conversation. And I suspect he's going to set that up in a minute, I think, for everybody. Um, but uh, but I think it is one of those things that's worth thinking about, because I think that's a change that's happening, right? We're using Gen AI, and we're thinking about, well, what does cheating mean in this, in this new AI world, right? And maybe it's a little bit different. I had this conversation with the RHD students uh, last week, earlier this week, last week, um, when I was talking to the RHD intensive about this as well, because they, of course, asked me to come to the RHD intensive and talk about AI in research. Um, so I had sort of had that conversation. They had some interesting ideas. So we're interested to hear what everybody here has to say. But let me do the, the, the standard introduction stuff first. And I always start with the acknowledgement of country um, and the acknowledgement of, our tr of traditional owners uh, of the lands that on which we're meeting and paying respect to elders past, present and emerging. And here I'm in Coomera at the moment on the Gold Coast, which is the Ugambeh Nation. Um, it's the Cumin burial of bul, bul, Buljen, I think it is. You think, you think I'd be able to say it properly, but basically the Ugambeh nation here on the Gold Coast. If I were in Brisbane, it would be Yagara and the Turbul people, which is where our Brisbane campus is. And as always, if you want to type in the chat the lands that you're on, I'm, I'm happy for you to do that as well. This is the Telcop, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's all of the blah, blah that relates to the Telcop. We're pretty well settled now. For a while there, we were sort of a new community of practice and merge together of the virtual augmented reality, uh, augmented and mixed reality uh, one and the educational education for learning one. I think we're pretty well settled now the last couple of years uh, as the technology enhanced learning cop. And there's the details about who we are, what we're trying to achieve and why the telcop is important. And I want to remind everybody, because I get asked every time I send out an invitation, that all of the episodes for the Telcop are on YouTube, including this one, which we are recording. Um, so we will put that up on YouTube, uh, unless the presenter tells me they don't want to, but I'd be really surprised if Robert does that. Um, we'll see how it goes. So if you go to YouTube, there's the complicated URL at the bottom, but the easiest way is just to search for Professor Tech's Tech Tube, that's me, um, and you'll find the uh, the Telcop. Um, if enough of you uh, follow me, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, then I'll be able to change that to a name instead of a instead of a instead of a random string of characters. I think you need a hundred followers. So uh, feel free to subscribe. Do I sound like a YouTuber? And don't forget to ring that bell. That's what they say, right? Um, so, so yeah, go there and have a look and you'll see everything all the way back to this first one that we did in the beginning of 2020. And you've probably already know me. I think I know a lot of the people that are here in the room, but if you don't, I'm a Michael Cowling. There's my bio on the slide. Um, I am Professor Tech among other things, but I'm my substantive position is an associate professor of ICT in the School of Engineering and Tech. And we're in my engineering and tech polo today. Uh, and just started working on another project called the Queensland Future Skills Project as well. Um, and then the other person you've already heard from is the other champion, which is Robert Vanderberg. Uh, he's up in Bundaberg, uh, 
Uh, he's a senior lecturer in the School of Education and the Arts. Um, and you can see all of his details there. And then I'm not sure if he's here, but our other champion is Daryl Clare. And if there's anyone on this list that you know, it's probably Daryl. He's a real doer, right? He goes around to all the schools and works with them on 3D printing stuff and getting stuff in VR and all of those kinds of things. And so that's uh, that's Daryl. And we usually have Daryl here at least once a year doing kind of a boot camp for Telcop. So, so at some point uh, you, where you might see us advertise sort of a boot camp or a workshop session, it's likely that it'll be run by Daryl because he's our kind of practical doer kind of guy. And then usually we'll have a guest speaker. And usually I put up the guest speaker slide with their fancy bio. Um, but this time, as I've already said to you, our guest speaker just so happens to be a champion of the Telcop. It happens to be Robert. And so I made him a separate slide for him as a guest speaker. And I, I, I updated his bio for him a little, the highlights being a couple of different things. The big one really being that he won an AAUT citation for outstanding contributions to student learning a couple of years ago. Also a uh, CQU Opal Award, if anyone remembers those, uh, for engagement. Uh, and also works really closely with a thing called Lantite, which is the literacy and numeracy testing that they do for initial teacher education before they're allowed to become teachers and that's one of the key things that he does in the school of education and the arts uh, but again you can read his bio there if you'd like to um and then usually just before i hand over to robert i usually try and find a silly photo of of whoever it is uh robert is very good at ducking out of photos. I, I searched my photo library. I've known him for a decade or so, right? I reckon I've got maybe five photos of Robert in my photo library. Uh, luckily I found this one. Um, so this is Robert uh, at the uh, Ascolite uh, conference dinner in 2023, along with all of the other executives for Ascolite. I'm the president of Ascolite. Robert is one of the executive committee members. I reckon he's had a good a few glasses of wine by the time we took that photo. Um, and so uh, I don't know, that may be the drunkest photo I have of Robert. He still looks pretty good, right? Still doesn't look particularly. Uh, that was right away. That was right when I got that. And that was quite early on, was it? I still think, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so that's it from Michael's little introduction. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Robert and he can tell us a little bit about what he's going to do today. But I do suspect that I'm going to be back uh, having a chat with you guys because I get the impression it's more conversation than presentation. But I'll hand over to you, Dr. Vandenberg. Yeah. So what I want to start with is sort of a please um, understand that this is meant to be a conversation about academic integrity based on some informal um, research, you know, I've done and had to deal with and philosophic thought. So don't hold all the thoughts or things I say in this thing to be my opinion or what I actually think. Um, what I'm we wanted to do for this first one is one of the things I see as a struggle going on is everybody is being very knee jerk and saying this AI is cheating. This is cheating. That is cheating. This is cheating. And people aren't posing questions. People are interacting in conversation. And part of our job as academics is to have these conversations, think philosophically, and not just let media lead the world of what cheating is, right? It's funny because um, I saw, you know, Ozembek, right? Ozembek is the new thing in America. Everybody says it's cheating to lose weight, right? And so Oprah did this new special where she brought PhDs in medicine in. Anybody guess how long Ozembek has been used to help weight loss? Any guess on how long it's been being used? Michael says five, 20 years. Ozembek has been used in weight loss research for 20 years. Oprah got mad at the two of them. She's like, you guys work at the Cleveland Medical Center. I donate there, I attend there. Why wasn't I told? And she, they literally said, it just didn't hit the media. We've been publishing on this stuff for years and it didn't hit the media. And that's one of the points I'm trying to get at is like academics, know things, publish papers, but not all of us hit the media. And sometimes the greatest thinkers in fields um, 
make change the world. And they were never in the media. I always tell people, if we were going to go on citation index, Vygotsky would have never been full professor, right? Because nobody ever cited Vygotsky, but he changed the world of education after. And he was just more ahead of his time. So what's my point with that? Please forgive. Don't hold anything to static. You know, it's being recorded. I know that. But and so in this conversation, I do want people to post questions from their and post an interaction from their own domain area. OK, because that one of the struggle with the concept of academic integrity. Now, I'm Anthony and Weber and I have, have been working on this academic integrity program through the School of Business and Law, moving to the School of Education. And we're now working with the entire university and the student. This student academic integrity program is going to be um, instilled in the university. And one of the things we do is talk to students about cheating and get students to be part of the conversation what is cheating and what they think is cheating versus academic integrity and how those two words carry connotation of difference, right? One of the big mistakes is we say academic integrity and we think that implies cheating, right? We think cheating implies the plagiarism and those are different things. And so these are big conversations. One that I wanna start off with is I have not found an ability where youth come into university and we can actually get them to switch that academic integrity is not cheating. We as academics might be able to do that and interact with it, but I haven't been able to see yet where I've seen them use the language and switch from cheating to academic integrity, but I haven't seen them in their interactions and, their, and the way in which they carry the construct behind the two. They're changing the word, but the word means the same thing in their actions and interactions. And that's something we, we have to consider when we discuss academic integrity versus cheating versus that. So I'll pose a question for people and I wanna hear about different fields, right? Because one of the things that we're seeing happen in, um, in advanced academics is everybody's been saying using chat GPT is a form of cheating. However, you really can't search any search engine anymore where you aren't getting an AI response, right? If you search in Bing now, Bing is partnered with ChatGPT, that's correct. So is Grammarly. Grammarly now produces an AI response. But if you just type in any search, it will give you an AI response and it will give you a search engine response. And half of the search engine response is going right to the AI response. And in the next six months to a year, you're not gonna have a single search engine that isn't using AI. And so the minute we say you can't use AI, we now are saying ubiquitously you can't use the internet. Now, I pose this question to Michael when we we're talking about this. So I, in my year six, had to write uh, a paper about concentration camps. Year six. I'm 100% sure I cheated. I remember doing this year six. I went to the library. Now I wrote about concentration camps because I'd been to one. I had been to Dachau in Germany and seen it and I had photos. So I thought, cool, I could put pictures in my research paper. I remember going to the library and I remember going to the, the encyclopedias and reading in the encyclopedias about what concentration camps were and writing my paper. And I'm pretty sure in my old age, looking back, I didn't completely rewrite everything. I'm pretty sure I used some of that Wikipedia, that, that's what I would be, but that encyclopedia, right? And then I know in high school when I wrote papers, it was all we would go to encyclopedias and many times to start our research, right? You go to encyclopedia, look up a topic, and that might, now back then, it didn't even point you to other articles. It just pointed you to other topics. I don't remember ever researching in my, um, even in, in uni, because the problem in uni was we still would go, I remember going to the library and trying to look up articles. I don't know how many of you actually remember going to the library and not having a computer search engine. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? So looking up other articles was like, you know, the bane of existence. I didn't actually research other articles until grad school where I really had an understanding of that ability. Now, 
we want our first year students reading only first texts. We don't want any of them reading textbooks. We want them all researching articles online, grabbing them from Google Scholar, and then of course, rewriting them on their own. Um, one of the things that used to happen was, I used to get students when I taught English in high school that would plagiarize. So I would go talk to them, what's going on? And you know what I found? They were plagiarizing because they had the article open on their monitor and then they had the Word document open on their monitor. And they just couldn't figure out a way to say it differently because they were reading the article of something they could barely understand. And then they were trying to rewrite it into their own words. And, and when you see it right there, so I had to go to them, you need to read the article and then get rid of it. It's the only way you can rewrite it in your own words. Mm -hmm. I would cheat. I would plagiarize if I saw the article because I'd be like, oh, that's just, that's, I wouldn't know how to rewrite the format, right? I'd have to get rid of it. And what I found was I had to teach them how not to cheat because the technology had evolved to the point at which they were teaching themselves to cheat. They weren't trying to. It wasn't even their goal, right? Their goal was to understand the article and write it as best they could. But the way in which they were doing it made it impossible. So my first post question, right, is this. Is it cheating if you go to AI and it puts up an answer and you rewrite it in your own words? Do we think that is cheating or academic disintegrity, right? <laughs> right? It's not having, not having academic integ it, uh, integrity. Yes, Michael, right, put the question in. Any thoughts? Go ahead, Lisa. I don't think so. It's called cheating um, because uh, whatever external source, how we how do we draw a line whether you ask a book or whether you ask an AI to, you know, it could be some book in some third world country, which there is no online reference and students can claim, you know, the same thing. So I don't think so. Yeah. Does anybody know what journals are now saying? They just want you to cite AI. They're not even considering it cheating. They're saying, put it in your own words and then cite it as a source as if you would cite a work. Uh, and you're gonna see in the next iteration, there's actually gonna be an AI and APA, uh, probably an MLA. Um, there is gonna be a way to set, cite a, AI. So now you're not plagiarizing from AI. No, it's everywhere. And because of that, it's an industry. We have to embrace it. I, you know, I'm going against policy here, everybody. So don't nail me to a cross or anything um but basically you can't get away from it this is how the world's going to work and in five years time it's going to be a very very different world and how we're assessing what we're assessing what's important what do they have to demonstrate what do they have to know is a whole other question and it's a revolution at the assessment level that has to take place not what tools do we use to and, you know, provide our students with, um, you know, academic tools. So it's a, it's a different thing entirely. I, I think personally, just personally, not policy, that it really, we can't classify it as cheating because it's, it's like saying you can't use a computer. You have to hand write your assessment. The computers are in industry, so of course we need to teach them to do that and we expect it. It's going to be the same with this. Michael's got his hand raised. So I made a poll for you, Robert. I jumped in, made a poll yeah. with your question. Uh, we have, yeah, can you see the results? 92% yeah. of people say that it's not cheating and only 7% of people say that it is cheating. I see there's a debate talking about accuracy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they did a research study, uh, encyclopedias are as accurate, inaccurate or actually more inaccurate than Wikipedia because Wikipedia updates and Pluto mm -hmm. is no longer a planet, but in most encyclopedias it is, they've actually changed the oceans and the seas in the world. And in, in most encyclopedias, the oceans and the seas, things are changing now, just because something's wrong in your write-up 
if you cite it, doesn't mean it's plagiarism. It just means the thing you read was wrong. And now the question you're going is, well, now you're questioning their research ability or their ability to understand what they're reading. But that doesn't mean it's plagiarism because we could always, in the history of time, cited bad articles that said wrong things, right? It's one of the reasons why many PhD supervisors, when they get their students, I do it, I hope other people do, but my students come in having researched articles, they have research ideas, and then I make them only research Q1 journals, and they find completely different things than they found, look at any journal publication ideas. Because that's one of the struggles, I think one of the struggles that's going to happen is AI is going to force academia for the first time in about 50 years to redefine and, and actually more people are gonna have to understand assessment and what we think we're doing in assessment and what academic integrity is based on the goal of the assessment. Does that make sense? I'll give you an example. I got a, a, a teacher uh, who went to this training, was frustrated and sent this email to me. And the question was, do you think it's right that a student, correct, do I think it's correct, that a student who can't read or write can get a C because they verbally presented a story for a story assessment? And I had to pick the teacher apart. I said, first of all, why does it matter whether they can read? Is the assessment testing reading or is the assessment testing storytelling? Is, this, is the assessment testing storytelling or is the assessment testing storytelling writing? Is this is it testing writing really? And you don't even care about the story. What if it's the most boring story ever, but it's written perfectly? Like you have to understand the goals of our assessments in order to understand academic integrity within the assessment in order to understand academic integrity um, within this definition of cheating and AI. I'll give you a student perspective, right? So when uh, Anthony and I wrote in our, when the Campus Morning Mail existed, we were the we were the first two articles in the first year of ending Campus Morning Mail. And, um, sorry, someone tried to call me. <laughs> I just got a, t a t Facebook Teams call, which is really weird, sorry. Um, but so I wrote this article and so I went home and my wife's Mexican and uh, which means there's like 15 kids that are all in college. So they all read the article and I got like grilled. I got this, like, well, I got these 15 college students or well, someone to college in, in Ohio, someone to college in California, someone to college in New York. So they all, and they all want to ask me questions. And I got to see a, a youth perspective that was different, right? Cause they didn't talk to me as professor Vandenberg. I'm just uncle. And one student who works at Amazon asked me this question. And he said to me, is cheating cheating if I don't get caught? And I go, why? And he goes, because I see my friends who don't cheat at our assessments. And I'm going to tell you, I cheated at some. And at work, I've had to cheat to get answers the same way I cheated to get assessments done. And I tell my work I cheated and nobody cares. Nobody cares that I cheated the same way I was defined as cheating at work. And so he's in working at Amazon means he works in programming, right? He works in database design. And what he said was they would ask him these database design questions. They would want him to figure them out. And he went to find code. Now, this was before ChatGPT. So for us to think ChatGPT has started cheating is wrong. There's always been code places where people will give you the code if you ask questions. There's always been these type of places. So he went on, got that, did it in class, kind of wrote the code in his own way by getting the code that, so it wasn't exactly what the other person told him, got the answer, and now he's at Amazon doing the same thing. He says he uses the same place all the time. He's actually had bosses tell him, if you don't know, go there. And so the question then is, and I, I, I'm saying this because every field has to have a different definition of what your academic integrity is, and what academic integrity means in that field. Because right now, AI is showing many companies are just reducing their coding people, period, because ChatGPT, the AI can do it. Not ChatGPT in that instance, AI can do it. So they're not developing AI software, just write the code for you. And they don't need this, they're just finding people. 
But Michael's got a comment. Picking up on what you said, Ben, and, and I'm, I'm watching Lisa carefully to make sure she doesn't fall over when I say this. Um, are we in a world where where academic misconduct is just something that's very difficult for us to report on? Is is our academic is academic misconduct a thing of the past, or do we need to, as you're saying, unpack what we may, mean by academic integrity and maybe think about what that means? And Jennifer in the chat has yeah. mentioned. A of things she said things like well what about if we have doctors that don't know their material you know there's a certain level of rote learning in the medical medical profession and clearly we want doctors to know that so how do we unpack what we mean by academic integrity in this post so this i'll post? give a little quick sort of twist on that i have a lot of friends that are doctors and i'll ask doctors questions about not their specialty and you know what they respond i don't know anything about that I don't remember what I did in medical school. I don't know. They know their specialties. They know what they do day in, day out, and they are only researching what they do, right? And there's a reason we have general surgeons and specialist surgeons, right? I tell you right now, if I'm on a plane and there's something wrong with me, I don't want a plastic surgeon helping me out. <laughs> I'm just gonna be honest, I know them. But Lisa Kerr has her hand raised. I thought I'd better respond to it, Michael. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, definitely it is a revolution in our area as well, most definitely, along with the redesign of assessment and the permissions and so on. Of course, it is a, a reimagining of what academic misconduct looks like, just like, you know, when contract cheating sites and the internet provided that availability and accessibility to students, file sharing and so on, when that all burst onto the scene, that was a bit of a revolution of how do we define this and what do we think is okay and not. So it, it is the same. Um, hopefully, it'd be lovely if there wasn't a lot of reporting as a result of this and we redefined what could be classified um, because we're overrun at the moment. It's great business going out there. Um, so, yeah, it'd be really good to be able to get the message across and agree as a university or an industry of, of what would and wouldn't constitute misconduct. But I'm gonna also now academically answer Jennifer's concept. Um, because cheating has always existed, medicine knows there are certain things they want to have either nurses or doctors to know. So they've always used invigilated assessments with them to ensure there is no cheating. And that's not gonna change with ChatGPT, right? So the realization is there always are going to be some certain assessments that have to be invigilated, right? And I, I think the people that are, and I want to see if anybody agrees with me, I'm interested with this, because because I'm a pedagogy, pedagogy specialist, I research all over areas. I do research in science, I do research in math, I do research in English, I do research with programming. I, you know, I'm the pedagogy that helps these fields that are content areas, right? And I think math is kind of laughing at the world right now. Right, because ChatGPT is not helping or hurting to students in math anymore. They've already had cheating stuff in math for so long. When the calculator got invented, they were like, crap, what do we do? And so they decided at some point, we're going to test invigilatedly whether kids can do multiplication, division, and subtraction. And when they're done with that, we're going to never care again if they can do it. We're just going to give them a calculator. Right? And then they're gonna let them have calculators on tests and they're gonna let them use calculators in these places, right? And so now they all do a certain amount of invigilation and a certain amount of work out things on your own because they realize that students can go into Sim Lab, all these math places, get the answers, but they also realize they can do that to learn. And then when they get to the invigilated assessment, if they can do it on their own because they use those places to learn, and then they can solve the problems on their own, they're not worried about it, right? So I agree with the nursing questions, right? The questions are important, right? There are certain things with it. Now, here's what's weird to me, right? So I'll share some history. I'm 51 years old. When I got into university, we all, every single student had to sit an invigilated assessment for mathematics and English. If I didn't pass, that assessment, I had to take a remedial math class at which at the end of it, I had to take the same invigilated assessment. 
I had to take a written assessment. And what they did was they went, okay, now that our first year students have passed that, we as an institution have agreed, they maintain these skills. We now know they can write. So then in my, as an English major, right? I only had five classes that were writing intensive classes. They didn't all have to do writing because they went, we've tested them on writing. We know they, and they, they then went, okay, because what they realized is since the history of time, people have been able to pay other people to write stuff for them. Mm -hmm. We all know movies from the eighties where there are people, uh, things were, where people were cheating that way. And what it was, was rich kids could cheat and poor kids couldn't. And what I think is really possibly, I'm not saying I think, I'm throwing an idea out more like that because you know, we're just talking, but is it possible that the real anger is now poor kids can cheat as well as rich kids can cheat? Right? Because if you watch one of my what, my favorite racist oh. movies ever is um, The Blind Side. They hire a live-in tutor for that kid. They, they have, they hire, they really do. Is that cheating? Is it cheating that you have enough money that you hire someone to live in your house who spends all day long teaching that student everything they need to get them caught up? Because they had the money to do that. Um, I did research <laughs> on Mark Zuckerberg, right? Um, the reason why Mark Zuckerberg was so good at Harvard was, well, in his middle school years, his father hired the best programmer in the world to teach his son programming. He just paid him thousands of dollars to teach his son programming in middle school. Hmm. It's it's a very interesting, it's a very classist argument, but um, uh, it's right. It's not wrong. And it's really, I mean, to be more politically correct, what Lisa said in the chat, which is that it's just lowering the barrier, barrier entry, right? It's it's making it easier for more people to cheat, which your argument is means that the poor people can cheat more, right? But, um, you know, um, that's actually been something that's been happening for 30 or 40 years. You're right. If you cast back to movies in the 70s and the 80s, the rich, really rich kids were getting people to write the tutor them and write it. And then we got contract cheating, which was essentially the same thing, but paid for and less money. And now we've got chat GPT, which can do it for th free. Right. So really it's just about changing the, uh, changing the barriers, right. More so than anything else. Um, does anybody know what the graduation rate of Oxford is one of the top three universities in the world? 99.9% point oh eight percent of freshmen that get in fail don't graduate don't graduate like think about that for a second now i know this for social fact i have friends who worked at harvard and they were told you don't fail students at harvard students don't get a's but you don't fail them oh by the way uh harvard's graduation rate is 97 um so what happens is there's this huge argument now for me as a Marxist theorist that it's possible. Now, the thing is, I don't actually know these answers, right? And I think that this is the conversations we need to think about having. I'm interested in seeing other domains, right? Because I work with nursing and they do a lot more invigilated assessment than education does, right? Because that before chat GPD or AI existed, they were doing more invigilated assessment. Mathematics that care more about the content does more invigilated assessment than other fields. Science does more invigilated assessment. Um, my son attended CQU for programming and my son attended ANU for programming. One of my, and my son is taking uh, three programming classes. All three have a final that is worth 35% or more of his grade. The highest is 66%. One of his class, the final is 66% of his grade. Um, invigilated assessment. Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad, by the way. I'm, I'm just saying it's happening in places. It's already happening in places. And it's interesting to see um, how these things work and how we interpret them. One of the things I think that's really important. Now, let's go back. I think plagiarism is where we got to get confused or isolate out or be clear on what is plagiarism, what is academic integrity, what is cheating. 
the place I see students understanding best is they understand I went somewhere, I copied it verbatim, I pasted it in, that's plagiarism. So I will share a true academic integrity story as long as it's just between us and the recording. I was failed on one of my assignments in my master's class at the University of California Research. Now, by the way, not just me, eight other people in the class of 15. And we were all told we plagiarized. And here was why. We were told we plagiarized because we had four consecutive words from another document that we did not cite. Now imagine, I'm, I'm 51, they're talking about 1999. So 1999, I was failed for an assignment. And so I looked it up, we looked it up. We were all pissed off, we looked it up. In APA at that time, that was the definition of plagiarism. Four consecutive words, not cited. Right? And so it leads us to this concept, even in the plagiarism argument, because we were freaking out. We heard the word plagiarism. We all went nuts. We thought we we're going to lose our degrees. I mean, we were freaking out. And we know we weren't turned in for plagiarism because there's no way the university would support her argument of four consecutive words it means you fail. Because she didn't say we copied verbatim from places. She said we used four consecutive words and didn't cite. Now, here's the best part of this. Ready for this? The assignment was to summarize one article. So we were supposed to summarize one article and we used four consecutive words without quoting it. And she, she dinged us off of plagiarism. Um, it was a brutal experience. And what's my point with this? I think in all worlds, we're still not even clear what plagiarism is, right? My supervisor, PhD, great guy, highly published, highly regarded in the field. I watched him write two studies, different results, same methodology, he did cite, but the entire two paragraph section of his methods were word for word, the exact same thing. Word for word. I can actually show you the articles right now. Word for word published. And he cited that he did it in the other article, right? But he put it word for word, exactly the same. And I would make that argument that I do think some of the science fields aren't as worried that if you copy yourself, or you copy the exact methodology you used, that isn't clearly plagiarism. Because we want the methods to be exact. We just want to repeat the science. And I think even the definition of plagiarism in fields is different. And I want us to start thinking about this because we think there's one ubiquitous rule. This is academic integrity. This is this. And one of the things Anthony and I've done in our SAM program is we get different students from every school and ask them what they think. And we, we believe there should be a different definition of academic integrity in every domain, not this universal one, because fields have different epistemologies of how they know what they know. And if you have different ways of knowing what you know, you have different ways of doing things. Michael has a comment. Well, as I was going to say, is this a good point, place to segue into telling us a little bit more about the student um, in the one that you're doing with Anthony Bishop, totally, the name of it is just totally blanked. Um, because I know that, and I posted this, the Campus Morning Mail piece that you mentioned to the chat a little bit earlier for people. I know that um, it's, it's about getting the students involved in this discussion about academic integrity. Is that the intention to get them thinking about what academic integrity means from a positive point of view or just unpacking what misconduct means? Tell us a bit more about the project with Anthony. The, the goal of it is to broaden the lecturer's perceptions of the students' perceptions. And what ended up happening is revamping the, the, we, the school of business and law completely revamped their assessments because they learned from the students what meant learning, right? Um, one of the things that I struggle with being, now hear me out because this gets me, but I got friends, we have these academic conversations all the time, and I come from a much different world than they do. All of them are Australian-based, and I'm very American-based. And one of the things that we always argue on is they'll say things like, but we're trying to develop lifelong learners. I go, look, I'm a developmental psychologist. I'm probably one of the, the, the top people that understand developmental learning. And guess what? 
There is no human that is not a lifelong learner. It's not a possible construct. You can't stop learning, right? So when somebody uses that phrase, we want to develop a lifelong learner, inadvertently, what they mean is, I want my students to learn my content for the rest of their life. But what the students will tell you is, I'm not even going to get a job in the field that I got this degree in. Why do I need to lifelong learn this? When I was visiting my son at AU, I'm working out with people and I'm an academic. I asked all kinds of questions. I'm benching with these guys in computer science, lift weights. I ended up bumping into one of my coworkers' sons. I had no clue until after the conversation. I'm talking to them and he's an electrical engineer. The other guy was computer science. The other guy was, and they go, yeah, none of us are going to get to jobs in computer science. Because all my mates, they're doing uh, investment banking in Sydney, making 400K a year. Doesn't even matter what you come out of your degree. You go take those jobs and you make that money because they're just, they're predicting algorithms to see what are the best investments to make. We don't even, we want our students to be lifelong learners and they already are going to be. They're going to come out and have to learn new things, new places, new stuff. So what we're doing in this system is talking to students, getting their point of view, letting them tell us what they think this academic integrity is. So we have a growing and evolving definition. But in addition, you know, students have pretty strict opinions about what they think is cheating as well. They're not, they're as pretty, they're as strict as most of us academics are the ones that are, that, that work hard, you know, they, they don't want students not learning the material either. It's, it's just not a clear line, right? So yeah, that is our, our goal is to get students in and push both people. But Michelle Gray said, so if students use words or ideas from ChatGPT, which gives no citations, and how do they vary the source of information, this can inversely lead to academic integrity or cheating without the student actually intending to. So Michelle Gray, here's my question for you. Put yourself in a student position right now. And tell me, would you have the guts to cite ChatGPT? I don't think so, because I can't tell where it has cited from without doing the citation. Yeah, but think like a student. I know for a <laughs> fact my son has told me I'm scared to cite ChatGPT because I think they'll think it was written by ChatGPT because I cited ChatGPT. True. They're scared to cite it for fear it'll come across like I did a study, right? There are these AI detectors. So what I did was I took a question. I wrote the question myself, but I read ChatGPT, rewrote it completely in my own words, put in AI detector. I got a 62% uh, AI cheat score. And then I took a completely AI generated response and put it in. And that got a 72% AI cheat score. Like I think, we one of the things is the the students are just as scared about this as the faculty are you know they don't know what is actually going to be accepted from academic to academic right um they're not sure like if if i'm sure they know if i say ai in this class i'm going to get in trouble but they think i could get away with citing it in that class does that make sense lisa had her hand up earlier but i don't know if i, I talked her out of it I know, I was just, um, I wanted to make the point about some of the terminology. So we keep saying academic integrity, but that's actually a positive terminology. If they, if they are, if they have academic integrity, then they're doing all the right things. We're happy. Yay. We're really talking about cheating and misconduct. What, what defines misconduct or a breach of the academic integrity? It's really important when we're talking to students that that's how we're discussing it in those terms. We can't say, oh, you know, What's an academic integrity? That's not it. <laughs> what's an academic misconduct or what's a breach? Um, because uh, that's confusing for them as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then there, and then like when 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 um I, I think you put the article up, I'm pretty sure when we wrote the article, we we wouldn't use the word cheating, but the journalist changed it and told us we had to. We wanted academic misconduct and academic integrity, and they wanted cheating. And the articles that we wrote and we had to debate they said we'll pull the article if you want to call it not cheating and so we had to debate do we want to get these ideas out there about the student aided so we kept cheating in so that it's we could get the article huh trigger word yeah, yeah yeah it's the word and what it does is it gets our students frame of mind 
It, I'll tell you right now, if you say to a student, you breached academic, you had an academic piece of academic misconduct, they'll say back, so I cheated. Mm. Right? They, this, they're ubiquitous constructs for students today. Um, and I have to every year um, do this thing, right? Every year I have to go to my students. There is plagiarism and then there's plagiarism. When I see somebody who accidentally doesn't put a citation in for something that came from an article, I don't accuse them of plagiarism. I talk to them. You need to make sure you're citing properly because most of the time they're just not citing properly, right? But then there's plagiarism. Look, you copied this whole two paragraphs from another source and you didn't cite it. Here's a funny one. I got into an argument about plagiarism with a faculty member because what my student did was they cited an article that had none of the content that was in the statement they said. That's plagiarism. You can't actually take someone's article and say it said something it didn't say. And they went, no, it's not. They said, we put through chat. It, it didn't get a high cheat score. I went, no, I read the article. The article doesn't say what they say. What they're doing is writing stuff and finding any article name and putting that in. That is also plagiarism. <laughs> But we don't catch it because we don't want to catch it, right? That's the one that we're more okay with. Because why? We can't go through and read all the articles. Um, it's time consuming. Huh? It's too time consuming. It is. It and happens a lot though. It does happen. It, no, it happens <laughs> all the time. It happens all the time. Why? I know because I teach two classes which have to have a certain amount of research in it. And people tend to write their research in my area. And then they cite people that I like. I've had them cite people I know. Like, I'm waiting for the day they cite my article and say it's the opposite of what. That's what I'm really waiting for. They cite my article. But, and I'll be like, you think I didn't read it? <laughs> but go ahead, Lisa. Then we'll go Michael. You got to hit on mute. You got excited, so you're muted. We actually had an academic integrity case where that did happen. One of the academics was cited for their own work and it didn't have anything to do. <laughs> I said, but you're submitting this to me. Yet I wrote that. What, what? Like, do you think I'm not so going to know? <laughs> Michael, go ahead. Michael, oh, here you go. Sorry, I was on mute just for a second there. Um, uh, we're almost at the end. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. I'm interested in your thoughts about Sangeetha's question. Oh, we just lost Michael. That always makes it weird. Um, I think I will take the um, uh, explain it. It is just that uh, one of the comments that I made was we should allow the students to openly cite AI and include an appendix that AI has generated because that way we know what it has generated and how is the student developed on the work that AI has generated. Yeah. It already does. If you read the policy for CQU, they can use AI, but they have to cite the terms that they've put in. The They have to attach the output at the end of the document, and then they have to state the changes that they've made and what work is theirs and what work was generated by AI. So they're allowed to do it already. It's now, the that's policy. the point I'm worried that they're just going to give up. If I go to a Wikipedia and I cite Wikipedia, I don't mm. have to state how I changed it from Wikipedia, right? It, the deal is, you. so if you state how you changed it, I don't know how many students would know what, I rewrote it. That's what they're gonna write, rewrote it. Like, I don't know how you state that you've changed it. And I know what the reason being is. The reason is because ChatGPT is so fluid, right? You want them to stay ahead of the chain because there's, you, you can't go back and check it. But we've also realized that Wikipedia and other internet sources can be changed. That's why they put the date at which they have to, they have to say the day they cited it from that source because that source could be changed. And the realization is when I go to check it, it could be completely different than when they read it. And so I don't know what they did and we don't ask them to say how they rewrote that digital source that can be rewritten. Um, and so it's just an interesting thing to throw in. I, I like that we say they cite it and they say this, 
The question is, how do we say, how did you change it? But Jennifer has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, but Wikipedia doesn't write it for them. ChatGPT is actually writing it for them. There's a big difference between citing Wikipedia and, and typing your assessment task question into ChatGPT and it generating you a response. But how is that different in your perception? That's what my question is. Okay, my perception, because I work in health, I don't right. want my students using ChatGPT because they're all the episodes that I've seen and I've actually spent eight hours proving a student used an AI tool to actually write their whole assessment task. It's because the assessment task contained so many incorrect statements because it was health-based and chat just, GPT just pulled stuff out of wherever it felt like and even generated a reference list. So here's what my question is on that. So like, I know one student used chat GTP in my class. I didn't even fail it based on chat GPT. I failed it because it was just wrong. Why not just fail it because it's wrong? Like Yes, they failed it because it was wrong, but they also need to know you cannot just type something into a computer, let that give you the answer, and you pass it off as your own. That is cheating. That's, yes. that's unfair to the student, I think, because they're not, they're not verifying the information that they give. So they're putting in a terrible assignment. I mean, that's the stuff that I, I teach research. It spits out unethical, non-feasible research designs, okay? I tell them, this is your criteria. I don't get it. So they fail not because they've said, give me something out of chat GP, but because they haven't verified the information and they haven't checked on it and they haven't looked up sources to verify it. That's where I. That's where they don't get the marks on it. Like, if they want to use a machine to, to type for them, that's fine, but I want some thought in there which is not happening if they just give me a, an entire thing produced by a machine. There is no, there's not, you know, there's no thought from them and no learning. Yeah, I struggled in my um, youth. I'm, I'm not a good typer. So I started using Dragon when, when Dragon <laughs> came out. And I found one of the struggles with Dragon, right, was I could not produce actually, like, if anybody who ever tried to use dragon it's weird because you don't say comma but and like you you find yourself talking and it just writes whatever you talk and you're really thinking and you don't know how to think in your brain but then talk and it creates this whole thing but now what's happening with dragon is you can write and it starts to defend and it starts to fix punctuation it starts to make changes it starts to make suggestions um my question is this if you write it yourself and, and i'm not posing these questions like i know answers because I think each academic gets to make their own decision. I'm not telling anybody they're wrong, right? I've never said it. I support Jennifer's argument. I support these. I'm not telling me they're wrong. I'm just trying to throw out different points of view because we, we want to be able to see these points of view. But I see people when I publish all the time saying, oh, you should put this through Grammarly. It's got some issues with it, right? So they'll tell you to take your article and put it through Grammarly and let Grammarly give you some punctuation. Um, I used to do this for my students. I used to go out and buy free edited version of novels that were produced. And I would show my students how many punctuation errors are in there and say, this is why we all have editors. Everybody has editors. And the research on this is pretty clear. People make the same eight punctuation mistakes over and over again. Each human has us, even in their best writing, they have these certain ones that cause them problems. And they make the same mistakes over and over again. And they just have editors that fix them. And then there, yep. Yeah, now, I ask these questions because it's gonna. This line is gonna get grayer and grayer and grayer, where a student can just type in gibberish, and you know, Grammarly will turn it into a paper. And we're gonna see this thing happening and changing. And I think we're gonna have to think more about invigilated assessment. When do we say the student knows this skill? Mm -hmm. Because the reality is, in the workforce, you're gonna see. Very few people in the workforce are not going to be using, are going to all, let me say it more clearly. I apologize. Most people in the workforce are going to be using chat GPT or some form of AI to write emails. Mm. It takes up so much of their time. They're just going to pop it in and let it do it for them. Tell them this, tell them that, tell them this. Cause you know what we used to do? We had administrative assistants 
in the 1950s, 60s, we'd just tell them what we wanted them to say and they would go write our stuff. And now it's going to go back because what we did was we had computers. EAs got reduced from the business field because then you could write them on your own. But now we got ChatGPT and now they're going to write it for us. And that's the, and, and they're going to start asking these questions and be, students are start going, this is the way the world's going. Everybody else is doing it, you know, and they're going to answer these, these questions are going to become huge. I, I'm glad you had the conversation. Michael's computer died, so he was going to wrap it up. I apologize. I'm, anybody, I'm, anybody I'm mentioned... back. I'm back. Oh. I fin I got. I finally got in. Yes, my computer just died just as I was asking that question. Uh, but yeah, Robert, it is one o'clock, so we better. We are slowly losing people. So I'm gonna. I am gonna wind up and say thank you so much, Robert. It was a really interesting conversation. And just to repeat what Robert said at the beginning, he doesn't necessarily believe everything he says. But he thinks that one of the things we need to do as scholars is is ask these difficult questions mm. and bear mm. these things out, right? So just uh, bear that in mind. But can we all say thank you with either a virtual or a real round of applause? Thank you so much, Robert. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, the, the next TELCOP will hopefully be in about six weeks. Um, and you'll see an announcement uh, to the general mailing list, same as this one. There will be this, the recording, I will put it up on YouTube and you might, if you're on the Telcop mailing list, you'll get an email from me about that as well. And if you're not on the Telcop mailing list, let me know and I can add you. Apart from that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much to Robert. Thank you to everybody else for participating and have a really good afternoon. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.